Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. My name is Randy Grunz, and I'm the Director of Diversity Relations for the Terry College of Business. And I want to welcome you to the fourth in our series of our Workforce Diversity Program. Uh, this program is designed to help Terry students learn the cultural competencies and be exposed to the diversity issues that you will face in the workplace. You will also have an opportunity to attend or watch at least four of the sessions and then write a paper and do an interview to compete for the Workforce Diversity Certification. Today we're really excited uh, to have with us uh, Rabbi Justin Kerber and Jason Eaglin, and they will tell you more about themselves later. Um, of course, we really uh, have a very provocative topic on what does religion have to do with it, uh, the issues dealing with that in the workplace. Um, I want to thank our corporate sponsors um, and one of our major sponsors for this particular series is McKesson Healthcare. Um, our other corporate diversity partners are Ernst & Young, Philip Moritz, Delta Airlines, Sonova Financial, IDI, KPMG, Roxane Company, and Accenture. Uh, with that, I will turn the program over to our facilitators and ask you to uh, endure yourself and uh, engage in this exciting dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Uh, Rabbi and I spoke on the phone about what exactly we wanted to talk about. And some of the issues that we, uh, that we came up with have to do with uh, the bottom line. I actually have some background in the private sector uh, in a management capacity. And Maybe then we uh, should uh, first introduce ourselves. Should we? Okay. <laughs> I think so. All right. <laughs> My name is Jason England. I uh, actually used to work at UGA. I taught in the religion department. and. Uh, Presently, I'm a teacher at St. Pius X Catholic High School, um, and like I said, I have some experience in the private sector as well. <laughs> Rabbi? And hi, I'm uh, Rabbi Justin Kerber, and I'm the director uh, of UGA Hillel, which is the Foundation for Jewish Campus Life. Um, you may have uh, seen some of our programming around campus without even knowing it. Uh, among other things, we stage uh, UGA Idol, uh, along with the Sigma Delta Tau uh, sorority. Um, Auditions will be uh, this wen uh, Wednesday, tomorrow, if anybody's still interested in trying out. Uh, slots are still available. Um, go ahead. <laughs> All right. And, and, and he yeah. and I were speaking. This is uh, very formal. Uh, <laughs> we're not used to this, this sort of setup. So uh, by all means, if there's a question or a comment, please let us know. Uh, we, we envisioned this as more of an of a ongoing conversation. So and that's not a criticism. It's just a... <laughs> just Putting it out there is to sort of set the ground rules because it's a lot more interesting when we when we talk. So feel free to ask questions and engage us <coughs> in dialogue. But um, like I was saying, the, the, the bottom line is a, is a, is a key. I, I imagine that's why you're here at, at Terry is to, to make money. Mm -hmm. um, money's important. Mm -hmm. I like it. I use it. <laughs> um, I'm sure you do too. Um, so the, the, there are issues though that pertain to uh, religion in the workplace uh, from a legal standpoint and a retention standpoint uh, that are very important. Um, and an HR standpoint. All three of those are, are significant in terms of increasing the bottom line and um, making it healthy. Concomitant with that or hand in hand with that is this notion that um, happy employees make better employees, make more productive employees and um, when, when employees feel respected, when they feel heard, and I'm not trying to get all mushy, this is actual stuff, when they actually feel like they're respected and that they matter, uh, the odds are that their productivity will increase up relative to that. Um, and religion is one of those things in this day and age that uh, is still volatile, you know, given, given the current uh, political situations in the world as we know, and the, the wars that are going on. Um, I'll just give one anecdote and then I'll turn it over mm -hmm. to him. Back when, um, right after 9-11, um, an employee I had uh, was from Bosnia, who happened to be Muslim, and um, he didn't look like your standard Muslim uh, person. You know, he didn't, he didn't look like he was from the Middle East, which is the stereotype that's usually associated with Islam. And uh, a guy came in and heard his accent and said, do you work here? And he said, yes. And so he left. And that kind of thing, of course, you know, 
doesn't doesn't go well. So there are issues that still exist, uh, unfortunately, today, but they can be dealt with. And the the bottom line is, it makes the the workforce happy. It makes the uh, it makes our bottom line happy. With that, I'll turn <laughs> it to you. Um, <coughs> As I was thinking about this topic, uh, it just a personal story uh, occurred to me. Uh, in a previous life, I practiced law in a large firm in Boston and um, walked into the lobby of this law firm one day and with a friend of mine, the only other Jewish guy in the firm, and there was, of course, this enormous Christmas tree in the lobby because there always was one. Uh, and then there was this very strange planter-like thing that neither, right next to the Christmas tree that had these sort of stepped levels with candles, like those red Christmas candles stuck in it. And Mark and I looked at each other and tried, said, what is this thing? And right then, one of the partners came by and said, how do you like our new Hanukkah menorah? And he was so excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> they had tried so hard to be accommodating, and yet they had just so badly fallen short. Um, that we hardly had the heart to tell him. Um, I uh, was going to say that I think that workplace diversity, when I think of that, that term, I think it is really about creating a culture of inclusion. Uh, it is about not simply trying to take the approach of we've got one from column A and we've got one from column B and we've got so-and-so from you know, representing those guys over there represented, but rather it is about, it is about making sure that, that we have access, that, uh, that uh, our company, our business has access to the broadest possible talent pool, uh, and that it's being aware of invisible lines that we don't even, that we don't even perceive. Uh, and that's what Jason and I were going we're gonna to talk about with you. Um, when we were getting ready for this, we were talking about, um, just as a, as a jumping off place, the, um, the importance of symbols um, and how they have the power to both unify and divide uh, without people even thinking about it. Um, a classic example uh, being, let's say, a crucifix um, to one of uh, Professor Eklund's students at St. Saint, Saint Pius. Mm -hmm. Saint, what was it called? The yeah, yeah. High school, Saint Pius. Saint Pius. Yes. So the crucifix to one of them is probably going to mean, well, assuming they don't get hit on the knuckles that much, uh, it probably <laughs> means forgiveness. Right. It probably means love. It probably means hope, better future. Mm -hmm. Those are all pos all positive things. Mm -hmm. Believe me, Jewish guy goes into a uh, into a business interview and sees somebody wearing a crucifix. What, hap what first thing that happens into his mind is Spanish Inquisition. Second thing is uh, the Polish uh, church during the Second World War. Um, likewise, um, there are very few Catholics down here uh, in the Deep South, um, but some of you uh, are going to blow up uh, and make stupid money on Wall Street, uh, where you'll find that Catholics are not so, uh, so rare. Um, these are, these are things that are worth thinking about and, and assumptions that we make that are worth questioning uh, as we enter the workforce. Anybody got any questions, comments at this point? Yeah, I think the, um, one, of the, one of the hot topics today has to do with uh, traditional Muslim garb, the, 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 the things that the men wear, the hijabs that uh, certain women wear, the, tr the more traditional types. And automatically, when, when you see someone dressed like that, what do you think? This is not rhetorical. <laughs> you can say it. I think the women Okay. Okay. And, and, and that is, you know, of course, speaking to what he's saying, it's looking through it, looking at that through American lenses. Uh, and the fact is, um, and this is a, there was a video I used to show students, um, with Muslim women saying, stop saying we're oppressed. Mm -hmm. We choose to do this. Um, we're very proud of it. And um, in this notion that um, they're somehow being subjugated, and some of them may be, that's not what I'm saying. But the point is that um, to try, it, it, it's beneficial to try and be as open as we can because going hand in hand with what he's saying, not only do you have inclusion in the workplace, but if you pull from the broadest ta talent pool, 
you can also pull from the broadest markets, right? So for example, there are tremendous opportunities in East Asia, tremendous ones. China is still uh, waiting to be plucked, to, to, to use a business language, I guess. Um, the Middle East has tremendous opportunities. North Africa has tremendous opportunities. There's all these places where, where markets can be, uh, can, can be uh, what's the word I'm looking for, without sounding bad. I don't want to say ask, exploited. Ask them to the business people. What would be the politically correct term? Um, Engaged? That, that we can capitalize on. Okay. Um, but if you don't know what they take for granted in, in terms of traditions and, and, and symbols, like he's saying, um, your, your chances of success are, are minimized, I would think. Um, or conversely, someone who is familiar with cultural norms of the, of the place where they're working is going to be at a natural advantage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, what else do we want to talk about with the symbols? <laughs> I mean, I, I think that goes hand in hand with rituals as well. Yeah. And holidays. So maybe we should talk about rituals and holidays if people don't have questions or comments at this point. Um, there are laws, and I'm not a legal person. Um, the laws that I'm familiar with are only from experience. And, and with his background in law, <laughs> he can probably help me. <laughs> but I do know that when it comes to interviewing, um, there are things that we cannot ask. Um, not only because you violate the law, but because it's, it's going to make your uh, pulling from that widest possible pool, uh, it's going to limit it. For example, if you run a chain of retail stores and you have your people asking, um, do you go to church on Sunday? Can you work on Sunday? That won't fly. That's not allowed. Um, or you know, do you go to temple or do you go to, to services at the mosque? Whatever the case may be. Um, there are things that, that, that certain religions do um, require of their, their participants. For example, um, a traditional Muslim is supposed to pray five times a day at set times a day. What they are doing mostly down here in the Deep South is, if they do it at all, they're usually going somewhere where you can't see them. Bathroom, um, a, a, a small office, something like that. There are some businesses, though, that do make accommodations where they will give them a small room where all of them can gather. Those kinds of places are reaping the benefits in the sense of um, the employees are happier and the teamwork attitude is better. And um, so it does happen and it can happen. I'm not saying that it's something that employers have to do or even that they should do, but I think it's worth definitely checking out given you know, based on whatever business that you go into. Mm -hmm. and they do choose to pray five times a day. And you, being a person that's just sort of curious, um, do you have a suggestion of how do you approach them to sort of learn about those practices, why they do that, and, and uh, why it's important? Because, uh, you know, the, the typical person is going to be a little hesitant to, to start that type of dialogue. So what might be some suggestions of been my experience to, that the most forthright you can be is the best, without being rude. Why do you do that? Mm -hmm. Most people, in my experience, are more than happy to talk about it if they don't feel like they're, they have to be on the defense. Does, does that make sense? Um, they're, they're more than willing to share. That's been my personal experience. I mean, I don't think there's a guidebook or a manual on how to do this, right? I mean, it's a case-by-case -case thing, but um, most people are, are, are eager to share, especially given <coughs> you know, our post-9-11 world. Um, they want to erase the, the images that we have. Um. Actually, um, there is, um, I don't know if I could call it necessarily, it's not exactly Miss Manners for religion, but there is, um, I believe it's a series, it's start called How to Be a Perfect Stranger. Started off as a book explaining a real basic, um, definitely put out by Jewish Lights Publishing. I see people are writing this down. Uh, and I think Rabbi Lawrence Kushner is the general editor. And I think there's two or three of these. It started out as a, a real basic guidebook of how-tos when you get invited to your Muslim friend's wedding or your Hindu friend's family's funeral or whatever. 
uh, just like some real basic cultural norms and and obvious no-nos to avoid. Um, and there, there may actually be one in the work uh, for the workplace. I haven't taken a look, um, but it would be worth looking online. Uh, would probably be in the the UGA library somewhere. Would you agree the forthrightness yeah, is the best? Yeah, I yeah. would agree that forthrightness is the best. I would say, speaking from my own experience, that uh, most members of a minority religion in this country are are used to that sort of thing. Know perfectly well that most people aren't aware of their customs, and you know, as long as it isn't too uh, uh, too um, you know rude or um, or not respectful, are per perfectly happy to, to answer basic questions. Yeah, I think the tenor of the asking set, sets He's the tone. With it. If it's a, why do you do that with a sneer, that's going to get a, elicit a, a completely different response than, so why do you do that? You know, there's there's a completely different different tone there, and uh, I think it matters. Um, and then there's also the, would you like to come to Bible study? Probably isn't the appropriate <laughs> question to ask that person, although that happens. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that puts a chilling effect on diversity, if, if that's what we're going for in our company. Yeah, please, please. Mm -hmm. and my advice has always been, it's up to you. How open do you want to be about your religion? Mm -hmm. I personally would not do that. Like, if you're straight, mm -hmm. do you have any other thoughts about how to respond to them? Or do you have any other you're right. It's a trade-off, and it uh, it depends um, it depends on the message they want to send, and it depends on how important it is to that person that their potential employer know that about them right away. Um, I mean, it may be that in the case of uh, an observant Jew, that they want it known right up front uh, because they're going to be expecting that the employer allow them to end work on Friday afternoon so they can be home for Shabbat. Um, but, you know, as, and that person may want to make it clear to the employer, hey, by the way, I'll be here all day on Sunday to, to make it up if need be. Um, it may also be that you don't want to go there at that stage of the relationship. Um, uh, job interviewing is like dating, and it really is. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of risk. <laughs> because the, 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 empl the interviewer may not be in seminars like this or mm -hmm. you know, have that, particularly here in the South. And I mean, that's just the reality. Um, even going with a crucifix with the actual Christ on it, um, doesn't go well with a lot of Protestants, you know, and um, that that also evokes images and, and, and ideas and are you one of those and, you know, um, so it's the same kind of thing. It's risky. And and if someone's got that much pride and that much conviction, I mean, that's, I, I think that's entirely up to them. I agree with him. But it is, it's risky. There are There is risk involved, to be sure. That's a good question. That being said, if um, you know, if it if it uh, if that, I guess what that person should ask themselves is if the information we're going to come out later uh, and it, we're going to make a difference to you, is that a company that you'd want to work for? I think that's the issue. Yeah, like he's saying, for example, if if I have to leave at Friday, at sundown or before sundown, so I can get get home. I think you can incorporate that into the dialogue of the interview without being explicit because I'm an Orthodox Jew or whatever. I mean, you can just say, is that amenable to the, to the, to the work culture here? Can, is that possible? And they're very limited in what they can and cannot ask, you know. Um, and, and they should know that, hopefully. Um, and they can't say, well, why, are you a Jew? Mm -hmm. You know, they can't do that. Um, so, I mean... I think they're kind of on a need-to-know basis, wouldn't you agree? I think so, although I'm trying to remember now. It's been a while since I've taken employment law. Um, this would be a, a question worth uh, uh, worth researching and maybe getting back to. Maybe we could post it on, on uh, the website about uh, about legitimate and illegitimate questions in, in job interviews relating to religion. Um, I know what the things that are off-limits. You can't ask, are you married? Mm -hmm. Can't ask what religion you are. Um, 
you really can't even ask, yeah, if you have children. I don't even think you can ask what age you are. Isn't that right? Because that of sounds the, right. Yeah, that because those right. are all issues that yeah. are cause for discrimination. So mm -hmm. they're off limits. Yeah. Of course, that doesn't always happen in reality. Right. Um, right. On the other hand, if there's going to be, yeah. you are you are permitted to ask employment-related questions. Yes. If it if it pertains to the ability to carry out the job. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So. so. Hmm. Without being offensive? <laughs> Gosh. Because if you say, what's your, what's your percentage of minorities, it could sound accusatory. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I don't know. Best way, probably, honestly, is to go, is to go for an on-site job interview and keep your eyes open and see what the place looks like. Yeah. Um, in a uh, in a screening interview uh, with uh, uh, a white uh, male interviewer, it's really kind of hard to guess based on that. Um, the other way to do it is is do your homework. Talk to uh, don't rely on the interviewer. Talk to other people who have interned at the company. Um, uh, talk to just uh, you know. Uh, Google them. Um, see what the try to get a sense of what the buzz is about the place and what their attitude is. Are they are they really embracing a culture of diversity? Are they um, you know are they looking for a few token um, African Americans to fill uh, to fill some internal quota that they're not publicizing? Whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think I know that at least. Um, the, the one I'm familiar that I'm alluding to right now is the ADL. Mm -hmm. I know there are organizations out there. Now, do they represent every group? That I'm not aware of because uh, I haven't had a need to look. But I know there are organizations that also, like he's saying, will let you know, kind of like an Angie's list of uh, mm -hmm. who's who and who's mm -hmm. keeping up with, uh, mm -hmm. with being friendly in that respect. Um, the one I was talking about just now was the Anti-Defamation League. They're real big on that and, you know, talking about who's... Who's who's uh who's in and who's out? Who's who's looking out for us and who isn't? And um and and so those are helpful too. There is, I think, an an Islamic uh, equivalent to the ATL uh, Council on American Islamic Relations. No, that's not the right one. But there's no, but I know it. Somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and you know the other thing is the um you know the religion department at Peabody would be a boon, and people can pick the brains over there. We've got great guys in Eastern Studies, Islamic Studies, uh, Dr. Honorkamp, Dr. Godless, are, both are excellent. Uh, Dr. Godless's website, in fact, which is run through the UGA website, is one of those award-winning websites on Islam, and it's up to date, which makes it invaluable. I still use it. Hmm. Um, and it has page after page of great stuff, current stuff, and I mean, that's all he does is just call the web for things that matter and um, which is which is great that's a great resource do you, do you remember the website address not the exact but if you went into the UGA website and went to the department directory and went to or if you just googled uh, Islam UGA it would come up hmm. but um, the thing is there's so much the reason I like kind of sticking with the, these sort of classic organizations is because there's so many um, anti-religious people out there. If, like if you Google Islam, you're going to get a whole slew of um, people that hate it and, and have an agenda against it. I like sort of sticking with that. Uh, I like sticking with ADL for Jewish things. Um, in terms of Catholicism, I like Knights of Columbus. Um, there are organizations that have sort of paid their dues in terms of earning respect and they're just not sensational. Does that make sense? And those I find real helpful um, and current, which is important. Um, also, most major religions have um, regional offices. Those are also worth checking out. 
archdiocese. Um, I don't know what what it would be called in Islam. Or mm -hmm. It's worth mentioning at this point, however, that just as there are Catholics and Protestants, Baptists and yeah. um, Methodists, uh, a lot of other religions have different movements, divisions, denominations. Uh, yep. So it's worth, when you're doing your research, it's worth keeping that in mind too. Figure out, are you dealing with the religious liberals or are you dealing with the religious uh, conservatives? Um, mm -hmm. <coughs> so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you, um, I'll just, I'll just can, speak from example. I can, and I can give examples. And he, well, I'm sure he can give a ton as well. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you have your hardcore Catholic who, who, who fe uh, fasts on Fridays, most of them don't do it. And they still think they're good Catholics. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I happen to be in that group. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're going to go around. And so, so he's right. They, I mean, you, you kind of have to know what you're getting into uh, when you peruse websites because you never so I'm saying that's why the ones I mentioned I like because they, they're sort of more middle ground or tend to be um, more stable less sensational because he's right sectarian differences are, are huge I mean put a um, you know, put a Pentecostal and a, and a Baptist mm -hmm. together and you're going to have quite a conversation <laughs> right um, you just will this this Multiplicity of re religious diversity really is, uh, in large part, it's a result of uh, of modernity, uh, the modern era that began in the 19th century. All of a sudden, people began looking at religious texts through scientific eyes and saying, "Wait a minute, maybe this isn't the unmediated word of God. Maybe this has to do with uh, with uh, maybe this developed over time was written by people put together." Big schisms developed of between religious liberals and religious conservatives over what role modernity had to play in religion. Mm -hmm. uh, but for for a, a user friendly good website um, that will that will probably be useful to a lay user and not be too intimidating. I'm guessing BeliefNet would be. I don't mean to endorse it. It's a but it's probably going to be a reasonable source of information for someone who's just trying to get a basic understanding would you agree I haven't looked at it that recently it, it has its merits and it has its shortcomings um, my only thing my only issues or main issue with belief net is it tries to um, and tell me if you agree with this yeah go this has been your experience uh -huh. it almost minimizes the differences between religions and that I don't think should be the goal do you in other words they're all just different paths to the same to the same destination, and that's a very common belief by many. Um, and I personally have have issues with that because you're saying, therefore, that those who have I mean, the fact is, there are people who think I'm right. I've got the right mm -hmm. answer. I've got the right path to God or to, to salvation or whatever you want to call it. And to say that, oh, well, they're all the same, that is an implicit insult to them. You're saying they're wrong. Do you see how that works? If they're all, because mm -hmm. they are necessarily, some of these religions are necessarily exclusive. They just are. Um, there are key differences between, for example, Islam and Christianity. They, they're, they're just are. They, they're there. I don't think that means we have to uh, not get along. I think we can get past those in terms of workplace uh, or even just community living. But the differences are there, and I think BeliefNet sort of minimizes those and tries to mm. gloss over them as though they're not important. That's been sort of my vibe from BeliefNet. But, but I will say that he's right in terms of just getting a basic understanding of beliefs and practices. It is good for that. Is, is there a place for religion in the workplace um, dealing with morality and people's beliefs? Uh, why can't we just go in mm -hmm. and do our I'm going to put, put in a plug for the JBiz seminar that's going to be happening later tonight in Terry, the Terry College. I guess my uh, my sort of initial reaction to that question is that religion um, is an, not the only but a very important uh, source of ethical behavior. Um, and when we make business decisions, we are sometimes making ethical decisions. 
Uh, and I mean, that can be, those don't have to be huge, splashy uh, things such as does our company, you know, whether, you know, in the 80s, the, uh, the huge debate was uh, over investment or disinvestment in South Africa as a way of putting political pressure on the country to relinquish uh, apartheid policies. Um, where am I going with this? It can be simple everyday uh, business decisions. Like a client comes to you and says, I'm paying too much in taxes, and if you're an accountant, and I want you to minimize my tax exposure. So you go through his portfolio and you, you know, make the decisions that you can, and the client comes back at you and says, still not enough, be more aggressive. Uh, and you feel that you can't be more aggressive without violating maybe not the law, but about violating core beliefs. Uh, I think that is a, a very appropriate and useful place for religious belief to play itself out in the workplace. Um, the law is a floor, not a ceiling. Uh, and sometimes things, decisions that are perfectly legal aren't necessarily the best decision from a moral standpoint. Uh, and often shaky moral decisions prove themselves to have shaky uh, legal and even financial consequences later on. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say that just like people bring pictures of their kids or their spouse and put them on the desk or in the cubicle or in the office or whatever, I don't think that that religion has to be out there for everybody to see, but I think a lot of people have pride in it and want to display it just like they display pictures or their degree or um, my father-in-law has his paddle from his fraternity <laughs> hanging prominently in his kitchen, an actual wooden paddle that they used to spank him, I guess, <laughs> as part of his hazing ritual. What and fraternity? In this, cro in this crowd, know. that's important. I don't remember. <laughs> it was somewhere at Alabama. Um, Oh, well, and in I, Alabama. Yeah, I, I sit there yeah, and I sort of look at that, and I think it was beta, theta, pi, or something like that. But uh, Oh, your dad got it bad. No, I'm kidding. So it's just, it makes sense to him. To me, it's just goofy to me, you know, but he's my father-in-law, and that's just the way it is. And I, mean, I, mean, well, I think it's kind of like that, you know? I have another answer to that question, or a further answer to that question as I think about it. Um, I was talking to a, a kid from the class that was in this room before we met, and he was he brought up the example of Chick Fil A uh, being closed on Sunday, and said was asking, well, uh, are, does that mean all Chick Fil A employees are Christian? Well, no, it doesn't. That would be illegal, as we were talking about before. Chick Fil A can't legally discriminate on the basis of religion. Uh, it would be pretty obvious if they were trying it. What it does speak to is that the founders of the company uh, and the owners of the company and the management of the company espouse certain values, uh, like a seventh day of rest. Uh, and they have, they have made a business decision, uh, a business judgment. We are going to keep our entire company closed for one day out of the week, and therefore we're going to... I mean, maybe you guys can tell me better than I know. I, I assume they are foregoing a substantial amount of, of profit by doing that. But they're actually but, winning but in the they're, food courts. But they're winning in the food courts. Yes. Uh, maybe, they're, maybe their employees are happier, or maybe the, the, it's, an, it's an expression of the company well, the product's walks good. the walk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the product's good, too. Um, or another, maybe another, uh, an even better example might be uh, Arthur Blank spoke uh, on, uh, in the chapel on North Campus a couple of months ago and talked very, very passionately about how uh, Home Depot um, tries very hard to espouse, um, uh, espouse um, deeply held beliefs about equal opportunity um, and about... Um, I'm trying to remember some of the actual quotations that he that he said, but he and Bernie Marcus had this dream of uh, of of creating a nation of of do-it-yourselfers, um, and I think they were conscious of the fact that their of, of some of, of the discrimination that some of their uh, uh, forebears had faced uh, in this country. Um, and I'm trying to think of a of a third example. Um, it'll come back to me. Um, or I'm trying to think of a better example of how Home Depot plays out the Jewish values of its founders. Um, 
simply in, simply in the uh, simply in the uh, the way it treats its employees, I think, is the way is the answer to that question. Uh, Arthur Blank spoke very passionately about how how employees uh, how they could they don't have to give such a valuable uh, benefits package uh, to their employees, but they do, uh, and it costs them a certain amount, but it also it also um, brings in a certain amount. Yeah, they um well, they pay for school. I know that firsthand. Mm -hmm. um, they have a substantial scholarship program. Mm -hmm. Starbucks, yeah. another example, I think, uh, where there's religious yeah. values of the founders that are playing out in the yeah. conduct of the company. So, in answer to your question, <laughs> I, don't um, you. I don't know that. Uh, I think I think that can get too far, where you've got someone constantly putting in the face of the coworkers or clients, and. I think we have legal room to moon over in there too if, it, if it's affecting the work but um, it's been my experience and, and, and I think you'd probably agree really religious people tend to be very ethical people and the ones not always I mean obviously you just have to turn on the news <coughs> but those are usually exceptions those are the sort that's of that's why those make news exactly um, most most of the time the, the, the quietly uh, devout people are doing the right thing and they, they they make they tend to make things better. I, that's been my experience. Yeah. There's a hand. Yeah. Did you have a question? <laughs> um, especially in the workforce, because you are bringing in so many different types of people um, and so many different types of religion, or even lack of religion. Um, I was wondering if you overhear something, for example, if you are the fact that you overhear some coworkers talking poorly on Catholicism or something, what do you think is the best way to approach that situation? Is As a coworker or an employer? Um, as a coworker. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying saying something like, "Please don't say that around me." Um, I gotta choose these words carefully here. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are certain people that I work with that, um, and and have worked with since since I've been working that. Um, when uh, other people aren't around, they'll say anything, and they think just because uh, of your gender or because of your skin color that you're just you're just buying in, and um, and and I've been called goody two shoes or things like this. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. But the thing is, usually they always come around, um, and I don't have to be all Pollyanna about it either. I don't, you know, mm -hmm. just could you not say that around me? And that's usually enough. I don't I don't lecture. That's I don't. That's just because the choose your battles is a good phrase for me. Um, I got to work with these people, and I'm not trying to make wedges, you know. Um, and it's everywhere I've worked. It's not any one sp one specific place. Um, it's everywhere. It's just the way kind of it goes. If it's a battle that you do want to fight, but you're not uh, in a position of power, um, it might be something worth bringing to the attention of an HR department. Um, whether it's uh, whether you want to give a name or not, uh, hey, I've I've been overhearing things that aren't in compliance with the you know the corporate diversity mission vision values that are on the literature. Um, um, and yeah, because that goes for anything. That goes for gender mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. That goes for race issues, um, and religious issues even age issues, all those things are, are things that HR these days, they generally want to know about fast yeah. because they're worried about lawsuits as they should be. Yeah. And uh, so they have a vested interest in, in nipping that as quickly as they can. Probably this, the supreme example uh, would be uh, during the, the past, I mean, this isn't quite an, an, it's not an employment situation, but it was such a great example. We saw it played out on a grand scale uh, during the presidential campaign uh, when somebody at a McCain rally made a derogatory comment about uh, Obama as being an Arab, uh, and with, to which McCain's reply was, no, he's not, he's a good family man, or, or something like that, as if Arabs couldn't be 
um, decent human <laughs> beings. Uh, and the rejoinder of Colin Powell was just so brilliant and so spot on uh, that it's worth reading it in its entirety. Uh, Powell made this very moving statement about, you know, what if he were an Arab? What about all the Muslims that serve this country with distinction in the U.S. armed forces? Uh, and went from there. It was really, it was really well done, and I think it would be a great. I mean, if you, if it is a battle that you want to fight, if it is a battle that you're in a position to fight, uh, it's a great case study. Um, Absolutely, yes. absolutely. Yes, um, they're Arab Christians. Yeah, Arabs they're Arab are, Jews. <laughs> yes, Arabs. Uh, the, the term Arab uh, refers to a culture um, that traces its. Correct me if I'm wrong. Ethnicity to Arabia, to the Arabian mm -hmm. Peninsula. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Islam originated in Arabia, and Islam uh, in the eighth century of the Common Era, 700 Seventh. CE, seventh century. Seventh. Okay, and then in the following century, it through military conquest, expanded through most of the Middle East. Um, but um, they're not all Arabs are Muslims, and not all Muslims are Arabs. Um, no, not even close. Not even close. Um, there are a, a gigantic portion of the world's population is Muslim, is Muslim, uh, but it includes there. There are whole subcultures gigantic subcultures within Islam. Um, there is the whole Turkish uh, mm -hmm. expression of Islam. There is the whole Southeast Asian expression of Islam that mm -hmm. you find in Indonesia, um, yeah. uh, et, et cetera. Yeah, if just some quick stats, and, and if I'm wrong, I'm, I apologize, mm -hmm. but I think I'm right. <laughs> I'm rattling these off my head. There are some 1.7 billion Muslims in the world. There are about 2 billion Christians. Uh, 1.2 of them being Catholic and 700 some thousand being Protestant. Now, when I say Protestant, for those who don't know, that's a huge umbrella that encompasses some 27,000 smaller denominations, um, ranging from the very big, like uh, Baptist or Presbyterian or Methodist, and so on and so forth, to the to the more minor things like uh, Heaven's Gate, right, or things I like this. I wouldn't call that a Protestant. <laughs> But if, if you're going from a scholastic perspective of okay. trying to group them and okay. count them as something because they use the language of Jesus and the Father. All right. So. <laughs> if that's the criteria. Okay. I'm not saying they're mainstream. <laughs> not at all, but yeah. Um, at any rate, um, but of those 1.2 or 1.7 billion Muslims, in the U.S., only about a third of the Muslim population is from the Middle East, um, a great number are from Europe, especially since uh, the Bosnian War. A lot of them are refugees. Um, a large number are from, uh, as he said, Turkey. And, um, and not only and Turkey, like but that. that whole region of the world, mm -hmm. Turkmenistan, the whole former Soviet Central Asian bloc. And in Europe, um, in, in, in Europe, presently Islam is the fastest growing religion. It's the fastest growing religion in the world. Uh, and it's it's really making inroads in Europe, in Western Europe now. Uh, it already had a footing in Eastern Europe, you know, because of the Ottomans. But um, it's really taking a hold of Western Europe now, a lot. Meanwhile, Christian organized religion attendance is dropping precipitously every year. So you Islam you can, is growing rapidly in this country too, is it not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, maybe you would know. I think, uh, or I think I heard a statistic. Uh, recently that said there, there are now more American Muslims than Episcopalians. Don't know. Don't know. Okay. The number, let's see this, it depends on, on where you look. The number ranges anywhere from 12 million to 20 million in America. So, um, and again, it, it, it all depends on where you're getting your stats from. Um, because they don't take that data in censuses. Right, so we're guessing. Best guesses. But that's still a significant amount. That's a large amount. Well, 
What a, what a great example. Why didn't I think of that when I was talking about symbols? <laughs> sure, sure. In fact, I've even... Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, so that is an extreme, extreme example of what we were talking about before. Um, don't wear a swastika to a job interview. <laughs> I'm sorry. You, yes, in a perfect world, you ought to be able to wear one. Um, but uh, in this country, it's going to take a lot of explaining. Um, which is not to say that it ought to be illegal. It's just that, um, as I'm sure you've, you've understood. In fact, um, um, the... Uh, yeah, it's it's and it really is and it really ought to be, um, you know, for someone who is who is uh, for for a Hindu, it ought to be permissible to wear. Uh, but as a matter of course, most people simply will not understand it. By the way, if you go into um, uh, the temple in Atlanta, the uh, the largest Reform Jewish congregation in Atlanta, the building was built long before the Second World War uh, in the in the 1800s. Um, and it actually has a swastika design uh, worked, mo um, uh, an architectural motif uh, worked into the sanctuary. Um, it was common in the, uh, and it was introduced from India. Um, uh, yeah, sure. Sure, sure, and perverted it. But unfortunately, the perverted meaning of the swastika is the one that everybody in this, in, their, in our culture is aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Temple's beautiful. Yeah, it is. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> it's worth visiting. It's uh, it's yeah. really nice. Yeah, same building that was bombed during the civil rights era, I might add. So, I would like to approach a different side of religion, and that is people <coughs> who are not religious who may be atheists or agnostic. Um, maybe you could like talk a minute about the difference between those two. Hmm. And Okay. Well, to me, an, an atheist is someone who denies the possibility of there being a God. Uh, as someone who insists that all that uh, what we can see, feel, touch, you know, physically measure, uh, prove objectively is, is real. Uh, an agnostic is someone who um, doesn't believe in God, but doesn't uh, isn't militant about the uh, about the possibility that there might be one. Um, mm -hmm. Unless I'm getting unless there these have technical meanings that I'm not aware of. I think that's I think that's appropriate for this. I mean, okay. the, the 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 vernacular I would use for agnostic is I'm not sure. <laughs> you know. Or then there's the joke about the agnostic dyslexic insomniac who stayed up all night wondering whether there was a dog. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, um, and that's a good point because it's becoming more and more common for people to be secularized, which is, I think, kind of where you're headed with that, this whole notion of um, I'm a good person. I don't need religion. I've sort of rejected the whole deal, which... Um, Particularly when you get more and more urban, it seems to be more and more prominent. Um, do they have rights? Sure, they have rights. I don't know all of them because I'm not a lawyer, but <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of um, employers have stipulations in their handbooks or in their policies about things like distributing leaflets um, and so on and so forth, stuff like that, and literature, anything that promotes or that's outside of the, the purview of the company or is, that's not company-approved literature is not allowed to be brought in. Where it gets interesting, of course, is like you said with the holidays coming up, when people start bringing their Christmas trees or wearing the Santa hats or having the Christmas party. Um, I don't know that they could sue or anything like that. I don't know if it's just one of those things that you just sort of get used to or, or, or what. I don't know what the law says. Do you? 
uh, I could find it, but I don't remember. I mean, a Christmas tree is generally not, um, not it's, it's interesting actually. The significance of the evergreen tree uh, is actually a, um, it's a symbol of the everlasting nature of, of eternal life through Jesus. The significance of presence under the tree is the gift of eternal life uh, that Jesus offers you. Uh, nobody who says, oh, come on, it's just a Christmas tree, ever acknowledges that or probably ever even realizes it. Um, but, um, yeah, there ought to be uh, religion-neutral um, space uh, in the workplace as well. Um, and I and think there are better employers and worse employers with respect to that. Um, the company I used to work for was very aware of that because we had the whole range. I mean, this was a company of 50,000 plus. So they knew they would have an HR nightmare on their hands, you know, if they let things like that get by. Um, and, and that's why I was talking about values as the, as the appropriate place for religion to play itself out in the workplace because when you're dealing with values, you don't have to be Jewish in order to espouse the value of, of you know, decent treatment for employees. Yeah. Uh, it's something that resonates universally. Um, yeah. Um, is, is there anyone in here that has sort of a different view about <laughs> how it should be displayed in the workplace? I think ideally it would be nine. If one year I work in the Office of Admission, we had one person in upper management, and this was around Christmas, most major holidays. We have the Jewish holidays, the Hindu, the Islam, and the Christian holidays all come around the same time, more or less. It starts in the fall, all of them, the major ones. So it would be nice if you had a display of all religions, different things. But one year we did have, and that was nice, but the person left the work and then it's back to this official. <laughs> so you would prefer all mm -hmm. or none? Uh -huh. But it, it was a nice thing, Office of Admission, when people come in, uh, we have everybody prospect, including the parents, and it's nice to have, I thought, sure. send a good message to the prospect, students and their parents. Hmm. And that was very inclusive. I see. Was that here at UGA? At the, was that here at the, ter at the Terry College Office of Admissions? Oh, or okay. the? Oh, okay. Okay. Wow. And now it's just Christmas. It is worth yeah. Yeah. it is worth saying though that that um, although the holiday season is a uh, is generally uh, you, know, you know that's that's a phrase everybody understands and accepts. Um, what makes this the holiday season is still Christmas. Um, uh, major Jewish holidays happen in the fall. Uh, the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah is not particularly a uh, an important holiday. Um, in Jewish tradition, it has gotten swept along in the Christmas rush uh, and sort of turned into the Jewish Christmas, uh, as it were. Um, gift giving wasn't particularly part of Jewish tradition un until until uh, Jews became kind of a uh, uh, mainstreamed in this country, or Jewish uh, Jewish practice began to imitate the surrounding culture. Um, that's true of other holidays as well. Uh, Islamic holidays. Uh, wander around in the calendar. Mm -hmm. uh, they can the uh, the Muslim holy month of Ramadan can happen in any month of the calendar year. Um, Do y'all know why? Mm -hmm. It's because they operate on a lunar calendar. So, it, it's it's a little bit different each year. It, they operate on a lunar calendar of 28 days, as opposed to the calendar we're used to, which is based on the sun. Yeah. So it does. It switches. Um, in the month for Hajj, likewise, switches every year. It shifts a little bit every year. Those are the two sacred months, you know, when when these things can take place. So. Ramadan's a month. What takes place during it is a is a, a holiday called Psalm, which means fasting, and um, even um, sort of. Um, how do I say it? People who are less devout or more assimilated Muslims will even, most of them will participate in it as well. 
it's a pretty unifying experience throughout the community in the world where they, um, they fast from sunup to sundown, which is why when Ramadan falls in the summertime, it can be particularly grueling because there's supposed to be no eating, no drinking, not even water um, until sundown. And then you eat and drink. And, um, and the idea is to, um, it's twofold. And one is, you know, for anyone who's fasted, you know that your senses get a little bit keener if it's a brief fast, and I mean, not if you're starving to death, obviously, that's different. But if it's a short fast like that, your, your senses are supposed to be attuned to God. Does Judaism have something similar? I know Catholicism well, does. Well, there's, there's Yom Kippur, which is the, uh, the okay. fast day, uh, which is part of the, uh, the cycle of the High Holy Days, uh, right. generally happening in the fall. There are also various minor fast days um, throughout the Jewish calendar. Yom Kippur is about uh, uh, atonement for sins. Uh, sin in Judaism being something that you do, not something that you are. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no concept of being born sinful and having to have original sin washed away. Um, uh, but, but fasting is supposed to... It, uh, it comes from a verse in the, in the Bible that says, on a specific day of the year you shall afflict your souls and, uh, and repent for your sins. Mm -hmm. um, the, the rabbis, the original uh, uh, group of, of rabbis who in the Middle Ages invented or, or codified uh, Judaism took that verse to mean fasting um, and a number of other activities as well. Um, uh, fasting in Judaism is also sort of, it's usually penitential, uh, but it's sort of intended to, in, to induce a, a state of self-reflection. Uh, so yeah, I would say so. I might also say, getting back to the question before, uh, I guess the, the classic example of where an atheist has rights in the workplace uh, is that uh, I guess that is, is ought not to be asked more than once to join the Bible study group that meets in the lunchroom on Thursdays um, uh, or whatever, um, whatever religious activity. Um, I, um, again, I, for, I forget the law on, on such things. Um, probably most, most large employers wouldn't permit a... Uh, if it's a large one, or or, I mean, if it's on someone's lunch hour, I don't mm -hmm. think it's a big deal. Right. I think it has to be voluntary. That's, that's the key that, word, and that's the key. Voluntary. So voluntary, and not done on company time or on the company paper, or any company materials. That's where it gets dicey and mm -hmm. becomes an, an issue. Right. But I think if if a bunch of friends at work, I mean, it does happen. We make friends at work. If mm -hmm. they want to get together and go pray at lunch and it's on their time and it's a, it's an approved company break for lunch, I mean, that's, that's different. Yeah, so in, in that situation, the place where an atheist, um, I think, does have rights is if someone says, want to come to Bible study, and the person says no, then it's, then it's inappropriate to keep inviting them. It becomes, it becomes uh, a form of harassment, or it can become a form of harassment. Legally, you'd be better advised most of the time to have it outside. Yeah, I, I think you avoid issues that way. Yeah. But if it's happening at your workplace, I like I, I'm just I don't know. Mm -hmm. The law, the laws escapes me there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's great when it's not uh, when the when the member of the minor the religious minority doesn't have to be the one to start that conversation. Uh, it, yeah. Well, the way you the way you did it just then was was I thought spot on. Hey guys, not everybody in this office is Christian. Um, maybe we ought to think about having either adding some other symbols or not having the Christmas tree this year. You know, um, it's perfectly fine to to do snowflakes and icicles. Um, <laughs> 
Although I don't know if they do snowflakes and icicles in Georgia that much. Yeah. So I think a lot of people, particularly in the South, take offense to taking religion out. Mm -hmm. something that we hold near and dear. Right. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So you're sinning in your uh -huh. simple ways when uh -huh. really bringing uh -huh. all of these bad things on us anyway. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's right down the road there. The whole Ten Commandment thing Excuse went me. down. Over in Barrow County. Um, Uh, I've had friends who have uh, started going off on how great hell is going to be. Uh, we're going to have the best band. We're going to have the best food. We're going to have... Um, <laughs> um, uh, the other... Um, uh, that also can get to be an issue for HR um, to say that, hey, somebody uh, will not stop and it's... Um, it, and it's if, if you uh, use the phrase hostile work environment, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, that will do it nine times out of ten. Um, uh, and uh, the other way, sort of middle ground, um, humor is a good defense. Uh, be aware of, of the law, and um, and the th I guess I guess a third uh, a third way would be to um, uh, just. Uh, um, Meet them spot on. Thanks, I've heard the sales pitch. I'm not interested. Yeah. You could always engage in apologetics too. There's that. Yeah. Do a the rabid debate. Bowl, um, and, you know, start. Yes. <laughs> going into diatribes and. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. You know. I think he's right. Hostile work environment's great. Mm -hmm. That's like waving the wand. <laughs> That's a good one. I just like keeping it all out. I like work to be work, but that's mm -hmm. just me. <laughs> it's just so much easier. But then there, you know, people might accuse you of being a stick in the mud or <laughs> things like this. And I would also say that the the phrase "Where do you draw the line?" is problematic um, because sometimes these lines move, uh, and sometimes what wasn't acceptable 50 years ago becomes accepted practice 50 years later, or some amount of time later. In the, sen in the case of religion, um, the, uh, there are, I'm thinking of the Church of Scientology, which has a huge fight, or had a huge fight with the German government over whether it was a legitimate religion. Uh, that's the genius of America, is that we don't have to have those fights. Um, but to keep in mind that even if something seems completely kooky, um, it might not. It might be, and it might not be. And even if it is completely kooky, if you've got a valuable employee, and that's their quirk, might be worth being sensitive to it. Um, I think you should have to draw a line, but mm -hmm. in terms of what boundaries there are to how accommodations can be, I mean, there's eventually something's going to come into play. Well, can you give can you give an example? Well, Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I guess, I, you know, 
how feasible is that? You know, do we have the money to be able to do that? You know, are we still going to represent something incorrectly if we're not? From, you know, there's well, the, the setting. The setting matters. I think yeah. um, not every company has every religion represented. Uh, and not every person who is a member of a particular sect, religion, tribe, uh, belief system particularly wants uh, to make an issue of it. Um, uh, some people want to be left alone. Um, uh, Buddhists, for example, uh, really, really prefer that there not be a whole lot of symbols. When the Taliban destroyed the giant Buddhas in Afghanistan, the only people who weren't upset by it were the Buddha, Buddhists themselves. Um, uh, it gets back to to sensitivity and and culture of inclusion. Uh, the company, the employer, ought to be thinking about the practice that best promotes inclusion uh, in their in their workplace. Is that fair? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Last question. <laughs> I'm the wrong person to ask because I don't know a whole lot about it. It's a. Um <laughs> They're very, very, play very close to the chest. There's not a lot of out there in the public about them. Um, so what we can know is limited. Um, There's the book Dianetics. Yes, by uh, was L. L. Ron, Ron Hubbard. Hubbard. Yes, and uh, uh, it's basically an, an, an a system of. Let's see if I've got this right. You can live healthier and attain wholeness and things like this uh, through your mind power, is my understanding. Um, and I think nutrition plays a part in it, too, or something. I'm the wrong person to ask, It's certainly. It's a weird... <laughs> I, I see, I already I'm going on a bad road here. Yeah. <laughs> it's a mix of a bunch of different things that... Um, and I do know this, that there are a lot of... Um, a lot of theories out there pertaining to it, which is why I just sort of leave it alone. Um, like there's someone that says L. Ron Hubbard wrote it on a bet. I don't know if that's true or not. However, you just gave me a, a, a much better example of, of the, the where do you draw the line question. Um, in the 1800s, Mormonism would have been drawn very clearly outside the line. Mormonism was not a religion, it was a cult. Mormonism promoted polygamy. Um, Mormons were bad people. Um, today, nobody would, uh, would consider that acceptable dialogue, acceptable, um, not the word, dialogue. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a great example of a, of a religion that has become mainstream uh, and therefore um, uh, just because the early adopters may have been seen as, as kooky or as, as a cult. There's a, there's a saying out there, um, mine is a religion, yours is a sect, and theirs is a cult. Um. Yeah, the, um, you know, something that students and I have talked about is, if you look at ancient Rome, as decadent as Rome was, there were some things it just didn't put up with. One of them was cannibalism, mm -hmm. and the other was new religions. They didn't like them. Um, and I think America is like that in a lot of ways. Um, there are some things, I mean, we put up with a lot. Just turn on the TV and you can see, you know, where we stand on a whole host of issues. But when it comes to new religions like the Texas cult, and we say cult as though it's a four-letter word, right? Mm -hmm. When I say cult, it evokes a whole host of images, whereas cult literally just means a series of practices. But cult to us has this whole baggage associated with it of, the coops, as mm -hmm. he was saying, mm -hmm. out there in their compound. The Branch Davidians is another example. These groups, if, if the Branch Davidians were to survive for another 50 years, they would probably be mainstream as well. It's just what happens with the passage of time. It's, it's very interesting, and the Mormons are a great example of that, because they were. They were considered the deviants and the... Uh, that said, I, I better say right now that there are unhealthy religious practices. Um, if uh, I, my warning lights, red flags go up when I see somebody not allowed to have their own money, uh, when I see somebody not allowed to um, divulge the beliefs 
uh, in most cases. Uh, if I see somebody, yeah. Uh, well, Scientology, it, yeah. it's they won't tell you suspect uh, because they won't. Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, the Druze religion, D R U Z E, which is prevalent in uh, certain parts of the Middle East, is a secret religion. Uh, they don't give their their religious tenets uh, to outsiders, uh, but it's not a cult uh, because people of the Druze faith are free to participate in society, free to make their own decisions. Uh, Etc. When you see somebody who's not free to make their own decisions and make their own choices, that's when red flags go up, should go up. Oh. Great. Well, please join me in giving a hand mm -hmm. to Justin and Jason for this very insightful discussion today. Thank you. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to come out and to facilitate this discussion and share your knowledge and experiences. Um, the whole point of this discussion today and the other series is to get us to think about ourselves and to think about what we believe and our perception of other people and how our beliefs color those perceptions. Uh, I heard a gentleman say uh, that you should embrace the weird <laughs> because uh, as Jason almost said about the Scientologists, it's, it's weird but you know we really don't mean to be um, crude about that but if it's something that we're not used to we tend to think of it as being different or weird uh, and so our challenge to you is to rather than judge um, something that's different learn about it understand it and learn how we can maximize the potential of those people so that we build stronger teams and that we have more effective organizations. With that, thank you again for coming, and uh, we look forward to uh, you guys participating in our next workshop, which is next Tuesday at 1230, and it will be in room 312. So we invite you to come back uh, and to participate in that as well. Again, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Jason and Joe. That was fun. Thanks for having us.